And I would say at a very high level, uh, there's always this like um, exploration or discovery phase to the decision, right? People are just, just trying to uh, understand, okay, what's the landscape? Why are we making this decision? Why is it important? <laughs> Welcome, folks. I'm grateful to be joined by our guest today, Vivian Tan, who is the Vice President, Strategic Information Management and Global Relationships at Kaiser Permanente. Vivian, how are you today? Good. How are you? Uh, Anthony, it's so nice to join you today. Likewise, I'm so excited. I know you've got an expansive career at Kaiser Permanente, background in consulting on top of that, and then, you know, just tons of cool education. So I'm I've got a little bit of a fanboy going on right now, and I know that you do a bit of work in the uh, with the World Economic Forum on behalf of KP. So why don't you tell our listeners a little bit more about you, and then we'll dive into the interview. I'm grateful to have you here today. No, thank you for having me, and I'm uh, always grateful to come and talk about KP and share some of my experiences. Uh, I've been uh, at Kaiser Permanente for 15 years, and uh, Maybe I have uh, three parts of my, three, three jobs, if you will, uh, but actually maybe one job and two side gigs. Uh, and uh, my main job is actually to run a data and analytics uh, team, uh, enterprise team across the organization. We're about 250 people in terms of size of team. And we do a cross-section of work uh, that relates to data analytics from basic BI, uh, business intelligence reporting, all the way to, uh, you know, the application of artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning uh, to uh, analytic questions that uh, the organization has. Uh, in addition to that, I have two uh, large uh, programs to modernized uh, data infrastructure uh, at Kaiser Permanente uh, when I first took over the department. We had, I asked the team, you know, what are our data assets? And they said, well, we don't have one. We have 20 data assets uh, and we have them all the way from, you know, the 80s all the way to current state. So I even at that time had a mainframe asset uh, all the way to your uh, big data Cloudera uh, Hadoop platform. And we had to, it was difficult to actually find data, uh, make, make, uh, to actually cleanse data, to merge data together. So we are actually undertaking uh, hundreds, a hundred, the multi-million dollar project to upgrade our infrastructure. Uh, and then finally, I have two cool gigs. One is uh, you mentioned, uh, I actually have the great fortune of being the representative working closely uh, at the World Economic Forum, who gets to say that they uh, get to follow their CEO to Davos every year, uh, which this year we didn't get to go to Davos. It was it was a virtual only uh, uh, Davos meeting. Um, and then I also run a small team uh, called KP International, and we host uh, international guests. Uh, again, we've gone all virtual uh, given uh, where things are, uh, but we host, uh, we really interact with many people across the world who want to know more about Kaiser Permanente and learn about our model. That sounds amazing. Uh, it sounds like I couldn't imagine, you know, being an entrepreneur and seeing a lot of different businesses, but an organization like Kaiser Permanente and the amount of not only data, but system structure processes, hardware that you'd need to do that is in itself mind blowing. It's like a small country. And then one of my life goals is to uh, go to Davos regularly. Uh, and so I'm, uh, I'm also in awe of that, but that's really cool. So um, I guess it's, Maybe my first question for you is, what would you say is, I'll ask two, what is the most exciting part of your job? And what is the most challenging part of your job? I'll, I won't give you the challenging one first, but. Well, actually, they're both the same. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, the most exciting part of my job uh, is actually the fact that we have such interesting data analytic uh, problems and questions. Uh, to solve in the organization. And uh, in a lot of cases, you know, at the end of the day, when you solve this question uh, correctly, whether it's how do we segment our patient population in ways that we can provide the right care to them, 
or uh, how do we uh, decide, uh, you know, what uh, what new building to build and how much, uh, how big should our uh, hospitals be? Uh, or uh, another question, you know, in this time of COVID, how do we optimize for digital uh, and uh, help people get the care uh, and access they need uh, for treatment and uh, for, you know, um, for health? And um, all those questions, if you answer them, uh, truly will uh, touch people's, make a difference in people's lives, right? And actually in this COVID time, one of the big things uh, my team has been working on is to forecast uh, COVID census. Uh, so, you know, people, beds in hospitals. Uh, and, and, um, and these things are really have an impact uh, because that actually informs staffing, it informs how much supplies we buy. Uh, and, you know, when you do that kind of work and realize the gravity of decisions and actions, uh, people who are looking at this data and making, uh, using to make decisions and take action, uh, you cannot but be both, um, you know, compelled to try to do your best work. Uh, but also greatly humble and also greatly um, sometimes, uh, you know, having to carry that burden that if you, um, that we need to have to try to get to the best and, you know, the most appropriate answers. Yeah. And so that's, I think, the most challenging part of it too, because, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, you're not just, uh, you you know, the things that we actually work on uh, really do impact people's lives at the end of the day literally life and death situations and, and impact people for life. It's a, yeah, I could see that both being very rewarding when, and, and also very challenging and a, and a burden of it because you want to do well and there's a lot of implications. So, you know, it, it's really neat hearing about how you approach data strategy and because you have lots of data points and you, you know, it's critical to have them integrated across, you know, nationwide, et cetera. And I also heard the use of, you know, modern technologies, predictive analytics, AI, machine learning, which I assume is that sort of predictive behavior, especially using within COVID. How have you found in your 15 years at KP and then in previous organizations, the shift of data informing strategy? Because obviously not all of our listeners have servers that they can use to crunch numbers, but how have you seen that? that progress in your career, uh, both positively and perhaps negatively? Yeah, I'll start with the positive. And then I think the negative just comes with the challenges of the change that uh, you go through. You know, there are several, uh, I think, big uh, maybe shifts. And I'll talk about the changes on the data front and also the changes on the analytics front. Um, You know, so the first big, um, I think, positive uh, evolution Uh, is that, you know, most traditionally uh, data was always put in these very uh, discrete and structured uh, data silos or data warehouses, right? And there's really been a shift over decades, right, to move towards uh, these big data lakes. Uh, And, um, you know, initially everyone just dumped all the data they had into the lake, right? And and in some cases it became more swamp than a lake and it was (laughs) difficult to wade through it and find the things that you need. And I I see this uh, next iteration where people are very thoughtful about thinking about a data fabric and how a data, different types of data, different domains of data are woven together uh, into uh, something that's usable and valuable and actionable uh, for people. Uh, So I think I'm really excited about that move and and that direction, Uh, but it comes with a lot of uh, deep uh, work around data engineering. And we are having to partner very, very deeply with our uh, technology uh, partners, uh, both internal, our IT function, as well as you know some of our uh, you know technology uh, partners that we uh, you know buy uh, products from. So that's one path. I think the other that I see on the analytics front is there's a great shift on three fronts. One, data is becoming much more real time. Uh, you know, I used to do reports that were uh, monthly, weekly, sometimes even annually. Nobody wants that anymore. 
uh, people want to know what's happening now, right? Uh, and then of course, the second trend is not only what's happening now, but what's going to happen to me in the future. So there's the, uh, our analytics, it's much more uh, prospective and much more predictive uh, than it used to be, right? A lot of we used to do a lot of uh, descriptive analysis and diagnostic analysis. That's table stakes. I mean, people want that, but that's not enough. People want to know what's going to happen to, you know, to things in the next couple of hours, in the next year, in the next uh, day, in the next few days. And if you think about healthcare, uh, healthcare is a real time forward looking business uh, because healthcare is like, you know, like uh, the airline industry, right? If you don't feel that bed, it's gone, the capacity is gone. If uh, the time in the physician's office is not used, up, you never get that time back. So really being able to blend uh, real time and predictive uh, is extremely important. And I would say the third thing is we are much more shifting also into the uh, prescriptive and cognitive uh, analysis. Uh, prescriptive goes beyond predictive, right? Where you, something's going to happen. And then the next question you'll have is, okay, if this thing is going to happen, uh, what, what do you suggest we do, right? What is the right uh, set of action or what are the next best options to think about? Uh, so we are finding that uh, there's a lot more demand for, um, you know, sort of recommendations, if you will, a demand for recommendations from our members and patients' perspective. So a lot of our digital team, they are doing these amazing uh, prescriptive, um, you know, care navigation, care uh, recommendation uh, sort of engines uh, using even chatbots, right, and natural language processing so that uh, it's very easy and intuitive for our members and patients to interact with us. Uh, and then we are finding that a lot of our operators uh, want to have prescriptive uh, kind of, you know, analysis baked into uh, the um, information that we provide them as well. So we have actually gone mobile. I mean, that's the other thing about healthcare. Uh, not, not many uh, physicians or operators or providers are sitting at their desks, right? They're always walking around and, you um, and so I think if we cannot meet them where they are, which is on their self, you know, in their palm, uh, then I think we cannot deliver the insights that will be useful for them. Yeah, absolutely. So I heard a couple, a couple things around the, you know, moving from data, just being sort of ad hoc, and then making it linked, and then potentially having too many linkages or unclear linkages, which makes the, the data swamp but really trying to say, hey, how does it weave together? How does it move forward? And, and we all know that the data that you get is only as good as the, its clarity and quantity, uh, quality rather. Um, I heard getting that data in real time. So like having it when you need it and then also doing something with it as in making sure that yes, the data is great, but if you're not using it to drive decisions. And then the fourth point is accessibility, like not only getting it in real time, but like where you're at in a place that you can uh, make use of it when it's needed, not just, you know, oh, it's in a warehouse and it's gonna spend me two days to, to get there. Did I capture sort of the, the structure? Yes. Oh my gosh, you did such a great job. <laughs> cool. Well, one of the things that we hear, I definitely wanna talk about the data swamp because as the time goes on, people are going to start hearing data, but then people start muddling stuff. So what would you recommend? And of course, not everybody is a data scientist. What would be some basic things you say, okay, you want to get involved with data analytics. What are some key considerations, maybe two or three key considerations you need to think about before you start gathering data for storytelling? Yeah, you know, the first one, and we actually, um, you don't have to be a data scientist uh, to do this and everyone can do it in any role that they take, right? The most important part actually of the data and analytic uh, value chain or life cycle as we call it uh, is step one or actually even step zero. Uh, really getting clarity around the business issue and the business problem that you're trying to solve, right? With uh, data and analytics. And the greater clarity someone has about this, and actually this is not the work of the analysts or the data engineer. Uh, it's most often the work of our senior leaders or the executive that's running the function or run, in our case, running a, a division or a region or a market. 
uh, they have to be very clear what business problem they want to solve. Uh, and then um, it's the through the dialogue with uh, our data scientists and our analysts, uh, we clarify what is the appropriate uh, analytic question to ask to solve that business problem, right? Uh, and then, you know, then of course, if you know your, your analytic question, then it's very clear, okay, what data do you need to uh, have in order to answer this analytic question? Um, and what we usually find is the leader that is clearest about the uh, process outcomes that they are looking for, uh, either to improve or change or continue to maintain. Um, and then a very clear um, to tie these outcomes with the right uh, process measures, so to speak, right? So say an outcome is I want to improve um, patient satisfaction. Uh, and then you need to be able to turn around and say, okay, what measures uh, do I need to look at uh, that will make sure that I improve uh, patient uh, satisfaction? One very big driver of patient satisfaction is the ability to access care in a timely way. Uh, and we track that both, um, you know, hours to when you get an appointment, the percent of time where you can get appointment within the day, uh, to more of the qualitative measures where we survey people after their visit, right? And we said, was it easy for you to get uh, access to your care? Yes, no, uh, on this scale of one or five, right? So I think um, the clearer the question, then the easier it is to define the uh, analytics, uh, you know, uh, work and then the uh, data that's required. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And one of the things as we go through strategic planning with teams, and, and we, even just today, I had a challenge where it's like, well, I want to be project focused, but if you just want to get into the doing, it's like, but you need to know the outcomes first, because that will determine what you're trying to work on, not the other way around, despite the other way around being sort of conventional, because it's, you know, we do stuff, right? So we have to have that clear why, be clear about process outcomes. And what I want to reiterate to our listeners, what we says the ones who succeed the most are the ones that are clearest on the why and the outcomes. So if you want to be successful with a data strategy, spoiler alert, you're using data, even if you don't realize it, be really clear on why you want to get that. Did I get that properly, Vivian? I talked about the clarity of um, uh, understanding the, you know, the, the business outcome, right? And then being able to tie it to very clear process measures because that's going to inform the uh, analytic uh, question. Uh, I think the other piece that I think is um, extremely useful is uh, at least when we find, because, you know, I, I mean, I think our organization is large and complex, uh, but I, I don't think it, it's just something tied to uh, being a large organization. The importance of explaining that and um, socializing it and getting alignment and sponsorship across the organization for, uh, you know, sort of uh, analytic work, I think it's really important. Uh, and, um, and I think the clarity of t linking it back to the mission and the purpose and the vision uh, is also really important. And uh, the, I found that the leaders that are most um, sort of thoughtful and effective uh, are the ones that actually do a lot of that sponsorship and socialization and alignment across the organization. Mm. And then I would say the other thing that uh, I find that leaders, um, we really want to be a data-driven organization, right? And use data to make decisions and, and uh, have it drive our decisions. And um, there is, you know, different from data science, there is actually a real discipline around decision science and how to structure a decision and how to actually um, work a decision through a life cycle process. You know, like, like, like anything, I think decisions are made by people and people, you know, um, go through this process where I don't know what stages uh, of, of a decision, uh, but there's always like that. There seems to be a natural process, a natural cadence to which decisions get made. And the leader that's really in tune with these phases and knows how to navigate this phase and knows how to even steward the organization through each of the phases, right? And I would say at a very high level, uh, there's always this like um, 
exploration or discovery phase to the decision, right? People are just trying to uh, understand, okay, what's the landscape? Why are we making this decision? Why is it important? Uh, and, and then, you know, a leader has to, to take to certain steps in, in that phase. Uh, and then when it comes clearer, like people all align, okay, we, we understand the problem, right? Um, then there's this solutioning phase uh, to, to the, um, the, the journey where the problem is clear, but the solutions might not be. And there might be several options. And um, there is a decision around how to actually trade off and make choices when you have multiple options. Sometimes you, you only have one and it's clear. Uh, other, most of the other time, life is uh, you know, a bit more complex uh, and you usually have multiple and usually there's, no, there's sometimes no clear winner and you know, every option has trade-offs. And being able to be very clear and thoughtful about those trade-offs are important. Uh, and as you make those kind of decisions, uh, factoring the, um, the degree of uncertainty and risk is very important. If you were making a decision and you know that you know 100%, you have 100% confidence that decision you make will result in a certain outcome, right? You, you make a different kind of decision when um, you, know, you have an option and it's like, well, I think it's going to work 50% of the time, but 50% of the time it might not be. And uh, you know, factoring, being very thoughtful and explicit about how to factor in uh, risk and uncertainty. I've, again, seen uh, leaders who are exceptionally good at decision-making do that so extremely well. And how do you get a uh, decision to stick is probably my last phase, right? I, you know, uh, Anthony, I'm sure you and I have been around enough to been in situations where you've seen people make a decision only for their decision to be unmade, right? Uh, and there's a real art and a science uh, to actually helping an organization and team make a decision and stick to it. <laughs> Uh, and come back to the decision uh, when, you know, things seem like they are going in, in a different direction and reinforce and, and uh, sort of recommit uh, to that decision. So I feel like in addition to data science, which we are really, um, you know, pushing and, and advancing in the organization, it has to come in parallel uh, with this deepening skill set around decision science. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, so sort of working, working backwards from that. So there's the data piece and the data is functionally a tool to support leadership and decision making. And when we talk about decisions wanting to stick, you know, in my perspective, there's no nothing wrong with changing your mind. Like there's a time to change your mind. But I think what it comes down to and what you are alluding to is the communication and the clarity around and the context around if we did change our mind. Why did we change our mind? Are we changing our mind? Are we going back? Um, in regards to options, you know, the biggest thing we facilitate strategic planning sessions, we lead teams through a process and we find that people are stuck in this multiple destination trap. They have multiple destinations. They have too many opportunities and they're stuck instead of actually picking one because they don't have a framework, a decision model, like you're saying, around actually picking the next path while considering risk and uncertainty. Um, one of the interesting ones that like around the COVID vaccine, which we won't talk about, but you have these different vaccines and then you have different efficacy rates and then you have different side effects and then you have just getting COVID in general. And those are all cost benefit things that you have to weigh out on a human level. I can only imagine what your organization has to do to sort of cross section and segment that, but again, we are not gonna go there. Um, Understanding the decision-making stages, being able to communicate that, getting buy-in through the organization, and then um, tying it back to the mission and vision. So my question that I've had for a while, and I knew it was going to come, was I around the concept of dashboards. And of course, some have more sophisticated dashboards than others, but what really stuck out to me was the importance of socializing data, socializing decisions, and socializing metrics. So can you speak to uh, the importance of having a dashboard and potentially how your team has used that to drive both decision-making as well as communication? Yeah, you know, we are taking a different approach to dashboards and we actually, um, you know, yes, we, we are a large organization. We have performance metrics uh, that everybody uh, actually gets incented on uh, and we have to put certain dashboards uh, together to support uh, 
that kind of you know, senior leadership reporting. Uh, but increasingly, we're really shifting to um, reimagining dashboards as something that's very uh, user-driven and user-directed hmm. and something that's much more interactive uh, in nature. So our dashboards have really evolved to be um, in a way, portals where people come in and uh, data is visually laid out for them uh, in ways that are easy to navigate, right, and, and easy to make sense of. In fact, our uh, we now actually have, uh, and I'll talk about, um, uh, uh, you know, um, human-centered design in, in a second. We now actually have a lot of UX, UI uh, design thinkers uh, on our teams. Uh, to work with us to co-create and, and, and design the actual interface uh, that our, um, our internal cu customers and clients are using uh, because it's so important to actually meet people where they are, right? In fact, uh, if you have an analyst design a dashboard, it will have a lot of information on it. But when we go to our clients and say, what do you need? They are like, I need to know the three most important things uh, that I want to make a decision on. And, you know, everything else you can put somewhere else. You got to show me these three things, right? And put it to me, you know, show me arrows and red, yellow, green, so I know things are going in the wrong direction or not, right? So I think there's a real need to actually design um, things that in a way that the user is going to interact with, understand very quickly, uh, and, and then be able to act on it. Uh, and then for them, because, you know, a lot of our health, uh, a lot of our employees are very, very fast out. Uh, I mean, they're extremely <laughs> talented and highly skilled uh, professionals, right? Uh, and they have, you know, and, and in a lot of cases, they are closest to the data and information and the problems they're trying to solve. They are the best to actually think through oh, I'm interested in looking at this. I want to look at it in uh, this cut. I want to go down to the unit level. I want to see this yesterday. I want to see this compared with the, you know, the year before. Um, and so they are going to actually need the um, dashboard to be very flexible and to allow them to, uh, in a way, um, get their questions answered and navigate for themselves, right? So this whole notion of self-serve and having them discover the answers that they are looking for. And they are, the answers, the questions they have one day are, is different from the questions they have another, right? So being able to create something that's very interactive uh, is important. Uh, and then being able to do two other things, um, we call it, um, you know, driver diagnostics, right? So most of the time when people go into our portal or our dashboard, they are looking for answers. Why did something happen, right? And so being able to set up the dashboard in ways that we they can actually explore and understand the drivers. So they click and they can uh, have the detail underneath that. Uh, and once they understand the drivers, most of the time they will pivot and they will say, okay, what can I, what should I do about this problem? And we call it a uh, drill to detail. Then they are, they are asking a different set of questions. They are wanting to drill down to a level of actionability and uh, being able to give them that actionability, you know, through one or two clicks is really what they're going for. Now, a lot of times the actionability is at the patient or encounter level. And uh, healthcare is a highly regulated business, right? And we have a lot of data privacy uh, rules and laws that we have to, and, and we have to protect our patient information. So we are very, we're trying to be very thoughtful. How do we balance uh, being able to drill to the detail that people require and yet make sure that we are protecting all the right uh, patient sensitive uh, information uh, and make sure that only the right people who you know need that data get that data. So uh, it's a, like everything else, it's a fine balance to try to get all those pieces working. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I heard the the central theme to that was you know there's visibility on on one side of it, but use, having it being user focused and again like the self serve. But what I heard is it's data to empower. 
It empowers the patient to make a decision. It em empowers the um, site. I don't know how else to say that to understand what they need to do. And it empowers your staff to be able to say, hey, here's how I can manipulate this again to make data decisions. So it's ultimately data management, data collection, and everything that we've talked about so far is really just to be able to better empower and drive strategy. You just need to make it accessible and easy to view and manipulate instead of getting stuck in a swamp. Yes. Yes. Go, go we just solved it. Easy peasy, right? <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure we could have you talk more about all of the other data collection pieces, maybe, but I, I, I know we're running out of time here. I've got, you know, maybe one or two other questions. You mentioned, so we're going to change topics totally before we wrap yeah. up, okay? You mentioned going to Davos. What is the importance of not necessarily Davos itself, but a forum for global leaders, uh, organizations to discuss the world's problems, the world's issues, and overall the importance of just like looking at problems from a, a macro while interconnected level? Yeah, I mean, that's such a great question. And, you know, you could argue, given that Kaiser Permanente, we are only based in the US, right, we should only maybe care about what happens in our fall in, in our borders. Uh, but when we step back, and we look at healthcare uh, across multiple countries and multiple contexts, uh, it is striking to me how much more similarity uh, we have across the world, right, and how much um, opportunity that is to actually learn and share and uh, advance uh, together. And actually, you know, the, the nice thing is, while there's so much similarity around the underlining drivers and maybe some of the problems and the challenges uh, we have in health and healthcare, uh, there are a lot of different experiments across the world. And, you know, and, and you know, one could argue, oh, what does have a uh, developing country have to do with a developed country. This is where I challenge our thinking. Uh, there's so many pockets uh, within the US uh, where uh, we have vulnerable populations who, um, you know, actually in some cases do not have that same level of access that you would expect a very advanced country to have. And so, and we look at countries around the world who've actually solved that. So, so if you are in countries where the average wage is $2 a day and they've solved for primary care, there is something we can learn from a country like that. Uh, and so I think, you know, I think again, it's in that spirit of humility uh, and learning and um, inquiry uh, that we engage. I will also say that for health and healthcare issues and maybe it's so for any other big, you know, kind of climate change as an example or, or education, um, it's so big that it's beyond one organization and company to solve. And actually a lot of times it's beyond just private sector or public sector for that matter. And it's uh, when I see experiments that have, or I see work that's been done across the world where uh, people have been able to really uh, go after and address uh, some very uh, hard health and healthcare uh, issue. It's often through that, uh, you know, private public partnership, right, uh, which is all, you know, a lot of what the World Economic Forum uh, focuses on. And it's often around asking the questions, what do we have to do differently uh, in order to solve this problem? Do differently from a technology perspective, do differently from a policy perspective, do differently from a, a systems uh, perspective, and also take into consideration um, you know, the underlying economics, right, which is uh, the World Economic Forum, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times following, to be frank, following the dollars and following the economics and following the financials uh, allows you to figure out where the um, uh, pain points or the, 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 you know, the, what's the right word, the barriers to change are. And until you change those factors, um, you will not necessarily get the system level lift uh, that you are sort of looking for. And the last thing I would say about the forum, which is what they're shifting to, they have started uh, uh, a millennials uh, kind of group. They call them the young global shapers and the young global leaders. Uh, these are the, I mean, when you meet some of the young global leaders, you are just blown away, right? These are the people uh, under 40 who have already, uh, you know, 
uh, change the world in some shape or form. I as recently met with this woman who had uh, won some kind of peace prize, was working on a book. She was had just finished her PhD. She was changing the face of clean water in, in sub-Saharan sub, sub Africa. I mean, these are the movers and shakers of, of our you know, sort of future generation. And having them come in and have a voice uh, at the table, bringing new ideas. Uh, there was this 15 year old uh, uh, boy, uh, young, young man uh, who was actually, who had discovered a, a type of bacteria that could break down uh, plastic waste. And think about that impact uh, on, on the climate. Uh, if, you know, if you think about the amount of, I was told but there's more waste in our oceans than they are fish. <laughs> And I know that's that's not a, maybe that's not a good one to end this this call on, but I, I think there's so much new innovation and uh, thinking out there and being able to uh, you know harness that kind of uh, uh, power and excitement and passion uh, for these uh, issues um, you know from our next generation is something that's actually super cool to see. Yeah, absolutely. Why? Well, I think it, and here I was, I was like, oh yeah, maybe I'll get invited to that. I host a podcast, you know, maybe that'll cross it. I'm like, yeah, there's this guy fixing, uh, you know, water or, or plastics in the ocean. So maybe I need to add a couple more things to my CV, but that's another story. But what, really what I'm taking away is for leaders, global leaders, regional leaders, community leaders, family leaders, I think the really key takeaway around that is humility and learning. And I think it's at the heart of the approach to data science, to data management, to data collection, to be inquisitive in terms of what you know, what you don't know, and then to create a path to be able to bridge where we are, where we want to go, and anything in the way, and then using data to do that. So Vivian, thank you so much for sharing with our listeners today. Uh, it's been just so awesome. I'm sure we could talk for hours, and hopefully we get a chance to do so again. But uh, where can people connect with you? Where can they learn more about the work that you and Kaiser Permanente are doing? Yeah, um, most people can connect uh, with me through LinkedIn, and I also have a Twitter account, which I'm happy to uh, share. And uh, I can also uh, share my email with you uh, after this session as well. We can get a lot of people that are reaching out to you to talk, including myself, and now I've got your email, so that's great. So Vivian, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, our guest is Vivian Tan, who is the Vice President of Strategic Information Management and Global Relationships at Kaiser Permanente. Vivian, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a distinct pleasure. Thank you so much. It was wonderful talking with you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed today's podcast, please be sure to share it with someone in your network. You know, in a couple of years, you'll look back and you'll say, wow, I really wish I had implemented more of those strategies that Vivian shared. So really, every organization needs to be embracing data. And uh, I invite you and encourage you to do that so that you can be uh, the leader that you really want to be and solve problems within your organization. So my name is Anthony Taylor. My guest today has been Vivian Tan. Thank you so much for joining us on the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. And until next time.